So yes, uh, I'm here to talk about uh, National Importance Programme, uh, particularly in relation to the study of lithic sites, uh, and we're talking about Cumbria and East Anglia and their relevance to the National Importance. <coughs> Uh, just a bit of project background, so uh, it initially started with a desktop study which involved looking at various sources, HER records, publications, grey lip reports and so on. Uh, so the lithic sites in, from Cumbria formed the focus of that project and uh, the uh, lithic sites from East Anglia included as a comparator. Point of notice is that uh, the search of the HER records for Cumbria turned up about just under 300 records with lithics flint uh, tags, whereas East Anglia turned up 15,000, the three HER offices there, that is. Uh, you might think that's a bit biased towards one area, but the, the nice thing about that is that uh, the problems that we, we, the problems and issues that we encountered are shared equally across the board there, isn't it? Um, from those two areas, we, we chose three case studies, and these included a lowland and upland extraction sites. Uh, the, the reason why we both chose both of the areas is that as they both uh, lend themselves easily to uh, the assessment in relation to main aims and objectives of the National Importance Programme. Uh, once our desktop study was completed, we then convened a project seminar and that was attended by local planning authorities, um, representatives of Oxford Archaeology and uh, independent researchers. A, that meeting was uh, recorded, audio recorded, and then a transcription of that uh, was sent out to everybody who attended the meeting, and feedback from that helped to create the report and this presentation. There were a number of problems and issues that came to light during that, and those are going to form the focus of the rest of the discussion. I just want to uh, start off by introducing you to um, three case studies. This is a Lowland site. State and West, near Carlisle and Cumbria. Uh, this was investigated as part of uh, a road scheme, and basically, I'll show you what we've got. We have a dry land area and a paleo channel, a wetland area. The dry land, through the uh, excavation methodology, produced over 300,000 pieces of worked stone. The Paleo Channel produced a smaller assemblage of workstone, but also a huge amount of worked wood, including tridents, um, a beaver lodge of all things, <laughs> uh, and other bits of work wood. Um, and the sequence ran from the late Mesolithic into the early Neolithic, those being the main two phases, mm -hmm. and that was followed by activity in Bronze Age and Iron Age. I'd just like to say that uh, Prior to uh, us doing the excavation, there was evaluation took place and they found eight lithics in the trial trench that was put over this side. So. The second case study from Cumbria is the Langdale Axe Factories, which is these here, but more extensive than is actually shown in this uh, image. Uh, probably much more extensive into the lowlands. This is Cocked How, and there's a nice piece of rock art on there. And in the background, <coughs> I think that might be C through it fell poking through, and they, the site extends right away around that area. The third case study is Grimes Graves in Norfolk. Uh, I have to thank Barry Bishop, who, is, who uh, most of what I'm going to say is based on his PhD. But as you can see, part of Grimes, well, Grimes Graves is scheduled already. Um, so we're looking at some earthwork structures and then the rest of the area has seen quite a bit of excavation which has uh, revealed napping floors and what. Right, we come to the first problem in issues um, and this is defining and designating lithic sites. Uh, included excavated sites, you might think, well, once they're excavated, mm -hmm. everything's gone. But as we shall see, that's not the, not always the case in terms of their extent and understanding their wider implications. Uh, sites undergoing ero erosion also were discussed in terms of what can be done to manage those kind of sites. Uh, for example, in Cumbria, there's quite a few sites on the coastal locations which are undergoing immediate threat from wave, uh, erosion from wave action, also um, 
dune blowout and so on. Also in East Anglia, in the Fenland Basin, there's quite a lot of ploughing taking place. <coughs> This is revealing lithic scatters which were once in situ and quite a few of them are associated with structural remains. The most common lithic site is lithic scatters themselves. They're in the very nature of disturbed sites and most of them are without structure. They also have the problem of being composed of mixed material which the technological character that can extend from Mesolithic through to Bronze Age. So this some people it leads some people to question their archaeological value. Also, what became important through this discussion is that how we look at individual lithic sites and how they relate to sites in, in the wider landscape. And does that affect one site being more important than the other? So as, a, as an example, uh, I've done some, some research with a fellow uh, independent researcher in Cumbria. There's um, State and West. There. And we started to look at the uh, lithic record, Cumbria, especially for the late Mesolithic, and we, we began to see that there is quite a lot of activity going on. And uh, there is wider issues of understanding sites in terms of certainly in Cumbria, there's a great reliance on raw materials. There's so much raw material variation than you might get in other areas, as there is very little uh, flint available other than the beach pebble stuff, which you can find on the west coast. So this kind of exemplifies that uh, in order to understand state and west you have to look at the big picture. Same thing for Grimes Graves. Uh, Barry's research has highlighted that that's the scheduled area. He then looked at a, an area in the kilometre radius around it and using records held in the HERs to build up a picture of use and then he looked at a further area, so you begin to see what he likes to call the landscape of extraction. And he's basically saying you cannot look at Grimes Graves in an isolation, he's part of a wider landscape. <coughs> so then, another problem and issue, well not a problem so much, but uh, we needed to look at the existing guidance for the designation of lithic sites. So managing lithic scatters, this has been that, that uh, is obviously focuses on lithic scatters themselves, but it set up six criteria uh, and at the time of that publication any site matching three criteria could be considered as important. In 2012 this was uh, built on in a, uh, the sites of early human activity without structure and this basically emphasised that you needed to understand that the extent of the site and the physical mass to make it, to understand the site. <coughs> However, using the criteria set up in both of these uh, guides, there's problems applying them to sites and HER records and all legacy collections. And this certainly applies to the, the extent and the physical mass of sites. One issue that came up was maybe some preemptive guidance should be set in place to to consider designation of sessions so if we could set up a recording process by when you were recording lithic scatters that there was a set of criteria that you worked to when you were putting those together that that, that, that would help in that seeing if they were of national importance so just to uh, illustrate the issue of physical extent. Uh, we go back to Stanton West. This is the dry land area. That's the lithic scatter as, as excavated. But as you can see, it's continuing out of the boundary of the site. Uh, this has obvious this has obvious issues as uh, this site has been recognised as being of national importance, but it still doesn't fulfil the criteria of we've known its full extent. Same with Langdale. That's the Langdale Pikes. Loads of sites on top of the hills in the valley bottom and behind them. But as you can see, the stone that they're after to make the axis from is in this horseshoe shape with sites on Scarfell, Seathwaite Fell and Glamorara. So it's again it's just not 
case of a site existing in isolation that has all kinds of other areas to take in com into consideration. It is also not just prehistoric activity, there's shielings and other kinds of, so it's a whole landscape that needs to be considered. Um, one of the other things that was discussed at the uh, seminar was existing methodologies. So one of the main issues, uh, one of the main points well, that was a group value in, in a monument protection plan um, and other <coughs> ways of understanding individual sites within a group of sites in, in large landscape areas. For example, the Premier Archaeological Landscape Scheme, Dartmoor, Register of Historic Battlefields, and even down to some of the methodologies used for Grade 2 listing buildings and the historic parks and gardens. <coughs> One other point that was picked upon is uh, if we if we do need to review criteria contained in designation, then maybe one way, one, way, one one thing that should be included is the regional research agendas, and they, they 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 speak for themselves. They define strengths and weaknesses of the existing resource. So, as part of the post excavation plan for uh, Staten West, we took into consideration some of the points raised in the uh, regional research agenda, and particularly understanding chronotechnology technological variation in the dig site and raw material use in Cumbria. And I just want to illustrate that last point by showing you this slide. And as you can see, so Staten West is there. We have pitched stone from the Isle of Arran coming down. <coughs> we have now confirmed through geochemical analysis that uh, Scottish Southern Upland Chert is making presence on site. We've also done some geochemical analysis on some, some of the black cherts, and that's proved, uh, that ties in with the geochemical signature of cherts from the Pennines. So uh, I think it's a site about 82 kilometres away. So being able to tie into that, there's local tufts available, pebble flint on the west coast, and orca was also quite, quite common on the site. So it's by using those, you can stand, start to understand the broader picture of sites, and obviously, you start to see them at a bigger landscape. Another issue that was considered was designation criteria should not should be robust enough to cover all types of artifact scatters. In some instances, that's that's pretty straightforward, especially if you've got uh, scatters in relation with landscape features. For example, you might find a load of slag and some features nearby. You know. Pretty well guess that you're looking at uh, some kind of metalworking stream. Some of those sites are actually covered by shine, although lithic scatters at the moment are not. So that's maybe something that should be considered in the future. Uh, and I just want to illustrate that point by showing you this slide. Up. So there's the Langdale Pikes. Some people reckon they should be seen as a monument within their own right. Um, there are structures up there in terms of caves. So you've got all these sites scattered there. And new ones keep emerging as erosion takes place, footpath, footpaths, footpath erosion, sheep scrapes and so on. So. <coughs> In a roundabout way, you have structures and scatters in association. Another issue that was discussed at the seminar was management of lithic scatters. At the moment, certainly for Cumbria, there's very little management and stewardship that exists. Uh, it's, it has to be acknowledged that this can vary from region to region. In that respect, it's then difficult for LPAs <laughs> to manage due to the negative review of the resource as well. So. It's just some stone in the ground, it has very little value. Going back to Barry's work, he's used lithic scatters to actually build up his three areas of investigation. So basically, he went to uh, HER records and museum collections, analysed them, and was able to understand why the issues of the landscape. Because of the lack of management, this does leave sites open to a variety of destructive processes. And I think this illustrates it perfectly well. This is Langdale, South Street Cave site. That is actually a quarry site. And you can see, 1948, 
grass covered over the scree. That grass is gone. It's a process of animals overstocking uh, human activity. Believe it or not, people used to surf down the screes up there. So, <laughs> so there you go, it's gone. It's completely gone. It's now down to bare rock. But, uh, finally, um, the role of English heritage in, uh, in, in national importance and designation was discussed. And national importance is to be seen as a, a non statutory designation. There would need to be an update of national planning practice and guidance. A clear and workable set of criteria would need to be set in place. Availability of resources. So, for example, if we were to use HER records, there would be quite a lot of research need to be done and that mean, might mean actually going back out into the field and doing some field work as well. And finally, an endorsement of sites designation, designation to ease planning process, so it would need to stand up in the court of law. Right, I just want to finish with some uh, conclusions and recommendations. So one of the main things that came out of the, the review was uh, to review and enhance existing criteria for designation. As it stands, it's perhaps difficult to apply key themes, and these particularly define the extent of the site and the physical mass <laughs> from HE records and on excavations. It was suggested that non statutory lists of national park sites were might possibly compiled and cared for by HEARs, but uh, then we would need the means and methods out how this is to be achieved achieve would be clearly set out. Consider the role, role of regional research frameworks and landscape set and group value of lithic sites should also be considered. It was also noted that the uh, lithic sites need to be considered in the planning processes quite often at the moment they are not. So methodologies would need to be implemented for dealing with lithic sites at predetermined determination stage, as, as, as well as for sites that were discovered during archaeological evaluation and so on. Perhaps such methods could include field walking, sample test pitting, sample signal deposits and technological analysis. Uh, for unknown sites, predictive modelling or landscape characterisation would perhaps be useful and certainly the extent West shows us that uh, we can now start thinking about wetland landscapes and perhaps what might turn up during uh, any work. Uh, I just want to throw this one in because I think this uh, illustrates how the lithic, lithic scatters can be then used. Uh, it's not just a field quarry. This site was field worked as far as I uh, can remember about three times, but it built up a picture of uh, a lithic distribution within one corner of the field. Uh, Topographic modelling confirmed that that was kind of raised high land. Trial trenching proved the existence of uh, pit sites. We also know that there was pit sites here. Uh, so in the end, this this area was withdrawn from the, the quarry extension and was put in the stewardship. So it, it does work. And finally, just we need to consider management plans should be considered to. That, Number of effects from there, uh, and basically, there is a whole range of issues that need to be considered during management. Uh, at the moment, Shine, I believe, is undergoing some uh, ch changes. Maybe it's it's time for them to think about how to in include lithic scatters in in uh, agricultural management schemes. <coughs> it's just not uh, development that ha can have an impact. It's recreational activities, these should also be considered in management plans. And certainly unsolicited collection should also be considered. Uh, this can be a problem in most areas. It's a bit of a problem in, in, in Cumbria because as far as we can make out, collecting there uh, has been quite recent, whereas in East Anglia it stretches back for quite a while. So, to, so if we can do something about it now and set up some preemptive guidance, perhaps some something similar to the portable antiquity scheme that should help uh, and I'll just have a finish on that one. Thank you very much. Thank you.